42. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, wearied as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well? and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up as eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and he whom you now have is not your husband. This you said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will show us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but none said, what do you wish, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the city and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples besought him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him food? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? I tell you, lift up your eyes and see how the fields are already white for harvest. He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. 
They said to the woman, it is no longer because of your words that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Thanks be to God for his word. I love this story. So last week, um, we talked about the question of, disciple, will you leave behind? Um, what I need you to give up, and God's call to Abraham to leave his country and go to the land that God would show to him. It was also um, the story of Nicodemus coming at night to find out exactly who this Christ was. And today we come to the story of the Israelites grumbling in the wilderness and the Good Samaritan woman. And the question before us is whether or not we will let God change our lives. It's hard. We just sang a really different song, right? And who had trouble shifting from minor to major keys in the midst of that hymn, right? Um, these shifts of life, um, these changes of truth are not easy. Um, and it's hard to be ready for them. And then when they come, they're really strange and don't feel quite right. And we're off kilter and don't know what to do with it. Change is really difficult. Um, how many of us have been through something where we have been Abram, right? And we've left and we've gone somewhere different. We followed God um, through the Red Sea and made it. But that promised land hasn't come as quickly as we expected it to. And that rest and relief from all that we had endured and tried doesn't come. And we are spent and done. And the known is a lot easier to manage and control than the unknown. So even if it was slavery back in Egypt, even if it was terrible, we get a little distance and still struggling in the unknown. And it's just human nature to want to go back and to not quite remember how bad it was there in the midst of what is happening and what we're struggling with now. Change is difficult. The unknown is scary. And that's just the way that life is. But what God promises is to be in the midst of that in a way that brings salvation, in a way that brings hope. But whether God can be or not depends on how much room we give God to respond. So last week, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Teacher, we know that you come from God because there's no way you could be doing what you are doing except through God. So we know this truth. We know this reality. But yet it's still in the cover of darkness that Nicodemus comes because he has a lot to lose. He has worked. He's a Pharisee. He's a leader of the Jews. He is the social standing, right? So it's hard to give up and to leave and to venture into an unknown. Today's story is the fulfillment of the end of Nicodemus' story. Because Nicodemus gets stuck where the Samaritan woman doesn't. And when Jesus tells Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him, will have eternal life. The Samaritan woman finds that life. And, and before we get to that part of the story, let's just stay with the verse, for God so loved the world. That means not just the Jews. And so where Nicodemus in power comes to Jesus, Jesus in power goes through Samaria. That in and of itself is a huge moment of witness and changing of the truth in which the world operated at that day. Because Jews traveling to Galilee would lengthen their journey by two days to walk all the way around Samaria instead of go through. Because Samaria was the lost ten tribes of Israel way back when. Go back to the Hebrew Bible. Um, when the two kingdoms split after Solomon's rule, um, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, southern was Judah and Jerusalem, northern kingdom were these ten tribes that we're talking about, and Assyria came 
and conquered them. And we all know what happens in that time period of then um, everyone being deported or other groups being brought in. It was the mixing bowl so that there was no one group with enough people in one place to stage a revolt, which meant that that pure bloodline that was celebrated in, Judish, in Jewish tradition um, was mixed. And there were a whole bunch of other things that happened um, to just keep the pot being stirred all of those years and all of those generations. But suffice it to say um, that there was a saying of the day that it would be better to feed the word of God to swine, none, not clean animals, than to speak it in the word, in the hearing of a Samaritan. Um, so things weren't good. <laughs> To say you didn't like each other is the mildest understatement of the world. Um, this was a big deal that Jesus was here and walked through. It's an even bigger deal that a rabbi was speaking with a woman um, because that was simply not allowed. Not even a wife, a mother, a sister, no one um, in public could a man, and specifically a rabbi, speak to. Um, so the number of boundaries that Jesus is crossing in this conversation is staggering. When we come to the communion table and I take that loaf of bread and we think of all of the times we have been broken or damaged by life, um, Jesus is taking on the systems of that brokenness and that damage and what keeps us other and what keeps us separated. And in this conversation is extending that chance for what has been broken to be made whole. And it's confusing as all get out. Remember, we're shifting from minor to major keys here, and it's awkward. And so Jesus says, I'm thirsty. He comes with his own need. He's not the one who has the cup. The woman has the cup. And he asks her. He gives her power to help him. And she's like, First of all, trying to figure out that major to minor, minor to major shift of that this rabbi is even speaking with her and pretty sure he's a Jew and this is not anything that I'm prepared for in the social structure of the day and how these conversations go. But she's like, mm. so she challenges him and and what are you talking about? And, and, he's, and then he's pushing back and, well, if you knew the water that I had to give, then you would be asking me for a drink. <laughs> She's like, wait a second. Are you saying that you are better? Uh, because this well was a stagnant one, right? You needed the bucket to go down and get it. And what he's saying is that he had access to the springing well that doesn't require buckets because you hit the spring and it's going to come out for you. She's like, so are you saying that you're greater than our ancestor who built this well? She's in the same literal moment that Nicodemus was. Like, I'm sorry, born again? How can an adult climb back into his mother's womb to be born again? It's that same moment of confusion. But the difference is that Nicodemus gets stuck there, and she doesn't. Because Jesus is talking about this living water, about never thirsting again. <laughs> And this woman, here at the well at noonday, the highest point of the day in a desert, this is to avoid being with anyone else. Um, because a well would have been a gathering place where you get all the news and all the gossip and all the good stuff. But yet she spent time to go outside the city at noonday, going out of her way to make sure she didn't run into anyone. And so she's not having to come back out at noonday, not having to avoid anyone, not ever being thirsty again. We live in a desert. Heck yes, give me this water. I'm ready. Think of it. Look at this banner and think of being in a desert and look at that green and that life and look at the water and it pouring and springing. And who doesn't want that right now? That cool, sweet relief. And we've all had a drink and we're okay. This is the gift of Mary Pursley, um, and she put this together for us to have for baptisms and, and for um, any other moments such as today when we're talking about living water and its gift. 
And so we are commissioning this banner today as we talk about what it means for our lives to be saved um, as a visual way for us to claim that salvation. Word and hearing alone is not sufficient to paint the picture of this gift that is given to us. And so today we celebrate not only what God is doing and revealing in scripture, but what God has done through one of our members and bringing this added color and this added feast for these eyes and this added expansion of heart to our services as well. If you were here last Sunday, we had it right here, right below the shell, so that as Bill and I were pouring the water, there was something even bigger behind us symbolizing the grace being poured into this moment. And think and take time to look at this banner and all the care that has gone into it and the different colors of thread at the different points of the curves to bring forth the light and the movement in it. That is the love that we celebrate today that is for the whole world and that is for our salvation. And the changing point in this story was the woman's honesty. It's when Jesus tells her to go back and bring her husband. She tells him, I have no husband. I would ask that we don't get too stuck in this moment um, explaining the woman's sin or Jesus' forgiveness, because that is a powerful moment. Um, but it also speaks of our bias that we bring to the story, because that might be true, but it also might be true that this woman has gone through crisis and tragedy after crisis and tragedy um, because it was the um, call of the day that if your husband dies, that then your husband's brother marries you and takes you in. And so it could be that there was no one in the family to take this woman in, and the only way for her to survive was to live with another man who was not her husband because woman couldn't work and had no access in that time. So I just say that to say that we don't know what happened with this woman's story. And that's not the point to get stuck ourselves in the story. The point of this moment is that she was honest in talking with Jesus. Something the Israelites couldn't do, and they're remembering slavery and remembering all that God had done in bringing them out of slavery. And something that Nicodemus was trying, I would say, desperately to do, but couldn't quite get there. And being honest that this um, prophet, that this person outside of the religious system might carry more truth than he and the religious system of that day carried. And that that might mean a huge change that although Nicodemus saw it, uh, might not have been willing to give up. We don't know the fullness of Nicodemus' story either, but we do know the ending both of this conversation in which the last thing he says is how can these things be? And the ending later in the gospel of him coming in secret with Joseph of Arimathea um, to bury Jesus' body, but still in secret. And the ending of this story of this woman, after that moment of honesty and of sharing, and then being able to claim, Jesus, I see that you are a prophet. There's a dialogue that continues, and there's curiosity, and there's questions. So if this really is a new truth, if there really is water that will quench all of my thirst for all of life, then how do I access it? How do I be a part of this journey? How do I worship? How do I draw near? You Jews say it's in Jerusalem. We Samaritans say it's on Mount Gerizim. How do I be a part of this? And then even more truth comes in from Jesus that the location is not as important as our worship and our presence in spirit and in truth. And then not only does she hear from Jesus, but she hears the very name of God spoken, I am. The very name of God spoken to Moses through the burning bush, I am who I am. That same language is what Jesus uses to respond to say, I am he, I am the Messiah, I am the Christ, I am the anointed one. 
And in that moment, the entire direction of this woman's life is changed. For all the work that she has done to run away from that village and that people and show up at the well when no one else will be there, she runs back to them unable to wait to tell them what she has found, unable to wait to bring them back so that they can find what she found. This is the completion of what it means for God to so love the world, to send his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish at a well at noonday with no friends, but have everlasting life. Not only for one, but for an entire community. For God did not come into the world to condemn the world. Jesus didn't have that conversation with who this woman's husband was or was not to condemn her. But so that the truth might set her free. So that the burdens that she was carrying and coming to the well alone and doing everything she could to escape people would no longer rule over her, but that she might be set free, but that she might be saved, and in her salvation, an entire community's salvation. Y'all, I want this. This is what I want for all of us. I want all of us to thirst and to know so much what it is of the love of God that comes and relieves us and fills us and gives us more life than we could ever imagine. When that woman woke up that day, there was no way she thought that she would be running back to that village, that she would find friendship, that the Christ Messiah would be abiding, and that her entire life would be changed. But that is what is possible for us, and that is what I want us to dream together In this season of Lent, as we walk with Christ and we ask the question, will we, will we disciples, will we at Worth let Jesus change our lives? Amen. As we reflect on the truth, and that is possible, We continue in our Lenten commitment. We continue to give witness to change the direction of our lives, to get just a little taste more of what it is that God has in store for us. Would you join in singing our hymn of sending, You Who Are Thirsty? (laughs) 